Since the beginning of this decade, we have become aware that some of our men and women can be deeply affected by what they experience during highly stressful operational missions. Indeed, some have had trouble readapting to everyday life once they return home. This video was put together as a training aid to show how one mission in particular affected our personnel and how they have coped with this ordeal. As you watch this video, keep in mind that recognizing the effect of stress after many years can be obvious. But learning how to recognize the symptom of stress-related disorder during or shortly after an event is much more difficult. We must get better at recognizing this ailment, and we must assist those who suffer from it on the road to recovery. Civil war erupted today in the African state of Rwanda after a plane carrying the Rwandan president was apparently shot down in the capital of Kigali last night on its way back from peace negotiations in Tanzania. This attack triggered Hutu extremists to begin systematic massacres of the Tutsi minority in Rwanda and of moderate Hutu sympathizers. It's estimated that thousands have already been butchered in their homes, churches, and in the streets. United Nations peacekeeping forces already in Rwanda, under the command of Canadian General Romeo Dallaire, are helpless to intervene in the massacres. Their current mandate permits self-defense, but does not allow them to engage either the Hutu government forces, known as the RGF, or the Tutsi rebels, fighting as the Rwandan Patriotic Front. All the UN soldiers can do is watch. Maybe I'll have a chance to tell the story of witnessing uh, everything that we were seeing. And so I think that, that became a bit of a vocation, you know, that, uh, that we were literally witnessing the mass slaughter of human beings and that that would become in itself a mandate for us. Within weeks of the plane crash in April 1994, most of the 2,500 soldiers who were serving in the UN forces in Rwanda pulled out, leaving just a few hundred to keep the headquarters in Kigali functioning. Only a few Canadians were there for the early fighting, but over the next six months, the Canadian government would send over several hundred soldiers on specific missions. Many had only a vague idea of what they were in for learning to deal with the horrors of life on the ground in Rwanda, training themselves to expect the unexpected, coping with the bloody chaos that surrounded them at each moment would take its toll on every single soldier. These are some of their stories. Can 46763, I copy your report 25 DME from uh, Kigali. I landed in, in, uh, in Kigali Airport in, in a beautiful sunny day uh, with, with um, the sound of gunfire off in the distance, sporadic gunfire. Um, landed in an airport that was in utter chaos. There wasn't a pane of glass uh, left. There was shattered glass and de debris of one kind or another everywhere. The runway, I remember, was... was uh, very short, and, and uh, our time on it was very short. We were essentially ejected off the uh, off the Herc very quickly, and, and uh, yet left before we had time to uh, to have a second thought about where we were and what we were doing there. I guess the, the predominant emotion with me was was one of curiosity. Um, I could hear the gunfire. I could smell the death. Uh, very strong smell of rotting uh, rotting meat of one kind or another all over the city. But it wasn't until sundown that it really hit home where I was. As soon as the sun went down, the, uh, 
gunfire increased. And uh, as the night went on, we had um, heavier and heavier calibers of uh, weaponry used. And then through the night, uh, there were packs of dogs uh, that started a fight over the corpses, I guess, of the previous day's killing. But you could hear these dogs uh, moving about in packs and yowling and snarling at each other through the night. And that's when it hit home where I was. As the war weeks stretched into months, the remaining UN soldiers quickly ran out of essentials and came to rely on the daily flight of a Canadian Herc for resupply. Pinned down in Kigali, all they could do was defend themselves and some of the local population. Well, we had about 30,000 that we were protecting and we were moving them between the lines. And they were dying in our care because we had no water or food or medical supplies. I mean, we were protecting them from the other side, but they were dying as we were protecting them. I had soldiers going sick because they couldn't eat or drink because they simply couldn't do it with so many people with nothing around them. The war stretched on for over three months. By the end, almost a million people had been slaughtered and about one and a half million displaced. As the massacres wound down, help poured in from around the globe. The Canadian government sent a field ambulance unit from CFB Petawawa to provide medical support for hundreds of thousands of displaced Rwandans on their journey home. Within seconds of touching down, these soldiers would find that doing business in Rwanda was nothing like it was at home. We arrived, it was late, we flew over the airport, there were no lights in the cities, there were no lights in the airport, so all of a sudden we realized we had reached our destination, but it was like diving into a big black hole, we had no idea what we were getting into. Landed at the airport, got on these buses that were waiting for us, driven by the locals, they were locally hired buses. They had bullet holes in the windows, they were in really, really decrepit shape, and as we were leaving the airport down the road, there were areas where they, the, the uh, security people that were with us pointed out where there were actually um, RPA or soldiers in the bushes watching us go by, though we couldn't see them. So we had a first taste of that right away when we got off the plane. The unit set up in an abandoned milk factory about three and a half hours away from Kigali. They had limited security and were cut off from Kigali by dozens of checkpoints. On a routine trip to collect water one day, a small team of hospital staff, escorted by a couple of soldiers for defense and security, DNS, ran into a dangerous reminder of just how isolated they were. This goes back to where we weren't aware of the culture. And, and in Rwanda, women are not uh, respected greatly. In our mission, a medical mission, there's a lot of females in the medical mission. We didn't really pay much attention to this fact. Things had been going fairly smoothly up to this point. We sent a female med A out with the, uh, the debt that went out that day. And when they came back, um, they were visibly upset and we had discussed with them what had happened. And a couple of the RPA had come out of the bushes while they were doing their, their, their task and offered initially a chicken for the, uh, the female med A. And at first it was treated as a joke, but these people were very serious. And it progressed to the, the offer of a chicken a cow. I'm not too sure, but the, the livestock value increased for this, um, this, this person. And um, our DNS guys had to step in and attempt a liaison, not necessarily a show of force, and a liaison because more and more of the RP came, RPA came out of the bushes. And it was through sheer negotiation that our people were able to get away. So when they got back into camp, um, we, we discussed it with them. And at that time, we made it, we decided that we would not be sending females out on any of these missions anymore. It just became too dangerous. During the summer of 1994, the Canadian government also sent a signals regiment from CFB Kingston to set up a communications network for the growing UN force. But getting their systems up and running in the back country of Rwanda tested both their skills and their resolution. Mount Karungi was really, really cold at night, to the point where we got snowfall. 
and it was uh, an eye-opener itself here in Africa, standing in a hole in the ground, and uh, it's snowing on you. We, were, we, we knew that uh, Rwanda was a, a mountainous area. Um, we had tested our systems back in Canada in a lot of you know, similar um, geographical places, but uh, it was still a challenge in itself because it was really mountainous. And uh, basically, Mount Kurungi was set up as a relay station to take the communications from the base of one of the mountain and send it over the top to another location, Kigali itself. I remember one day we were up in the mountain, we were going to a place called Kubuye, and we were traveling along the mountainside, which was in itself quite an adventure because you're, you're looking down the face of this mountain and there's, there's no uh, guardrails to stop you from falling over the edge. And uh, we come across a roadblock, which was typical. There was roadblocks everywhere. And um, they always asked for a cigarette. And uh, a lot of us didn't smoke. So we were explaining to them that we don't have a cigarette to give. And uh, I looked over my shoulder, being in the crew commander's hatch, I looked over my shoulder and I had an RPG pointed at my vehicle. And, uh, and when you have a 13 or 14 year old with an RPG pointed at you, you gotta wonder a lot of things go through your mind. Is he trained enough? Is the weapon working? Will he fire? You know, what will cause him to fire? So there's a lot to take in, into consideration when you're at a roadblock. Driving alone to the airport one day, on a route he took regularly, Corporal Casavoy spotted a group of soldiers running out to his vehicle, waving at him. Used to this signal for help, he stopped. And that's when the trouble started. So I stopped, got out of the vehicle, uh, well, opened the door, and uh, stepped out of the vehicle to see what was going on. And the moment I'd gotten out of the vehicle, one of their armored cars came and blocked the front of my vehicle, and they uh, traversed the, the machine gun around, cocked it, and had it aimed at me. So I thought, okay, <laughs> they don't need my help. And then a, a group of soldiers all came crowding up and crowded up around me in the vehicle. So first thing I did was push myself back, so I'm standing in the doorway. Uh, my rifle was inside uh, the vehicle, didn't reach for it, just started following my training. Training is don't give them access to the vehicle or your weapon and then just stay calm, see what's going on. The soldiers kept shouting at him in their own language, refusing to speak French or English. Several times he tried to find out what the problem was, couldn't get anywhere and decided to leave. And when I said, okay, you obviously don't need me. I'm going to get in my vehicle and go. Uh, one of the soldiers uh, cocked his AK and, and slammed against my forehead. So my forehead was up against the back of the, of the vehicle, like the door frame of the vehicle, pressed against me. And uh, I thought, OK, that was a bad idea. <laughs> Two men in civilian clothes showed up and joined the shouting, this time insisting in English that he get into their truck. But Kazavoy refused, offering instead to follow them to the UN headquarters to sort out whatever the problem was. They became more and more abusive. Okay, I know, I'm not caring. The officer uh, pulls back and gives me a full-handed uh, full slap. Just, I guess he put all his weight into it and it just slapped against me and slapped my head into the rifle. And uh, pretty high on adrenaline and everything. And all I could think when he slapped me was, what, that's as hard as you can hit me? And uh, so I, I guess I smiled at him because all I could think was, okay, you little person, here you've got me outnumbered, you know. Uh, I was told later there were 16 people there, but I only saw, you know, the people around me. But you got me outnumbered, and uh, I got a, weapons pointed at me, and then you slapped me? Like, geez, so I smiled at him, and he didn't know how to handle that. I guess I was supposed to get angry and grab my weapon. And so uh, he stepped back, and they, they talked for a second, then they just left. No comment, no nothing. They just left, got in the vehicle, drove off. That was hard. When I, when I got back, I had shakes real bad and couldn't function for a day. Spent a week thinking that, okay, I'd done this wrong if I'd just done the Rambo thing and gotten my weapon. I could have blah, 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 you know, saved myself, been a hero. Casavoy beat himself up mentally about that incident for several days until he learned that others had also been attacked and lost more than their weapons and their vehicles. 
To the UN soldiers in Rwanda, it seemed that driving around the country was becoming a most dangerous occupation. We'd come down a hill. Um, we're close to an area that we thought was the site of this massacre uh, and saw our first two human beings uh, in, in about 20 minutes of driving. And we pulled up to stop, uh, to, to ask for directions. And just as we pulled up, the whole world opened up on us. Um, roughly a platoon size uh, hit. Um, what saved us was the fact that we'd pulled the, pulled the vehicle in under a, a garden wall. And, and uh, between us and the people shooting was a low garden wall and a house. So we, we sat there watching the bullets stitch off the top of this wall just over our heads. Now, there I was, fairly new to Africa, in a, in a state of panic anyway, um, before we got hit. So I, I sat in my seat, very excited by all this, and I kept hitting my driver, uh, Captain Appiah was his name. I kept hitting him, saying, back up, back up. Fortunately, he ignored me. And he, I thought maybe he'd gone, uh, gone catatonic on me, but no. He, he waited until the, I guess, the first magazines had emptied. Then he backed up and nearly broke my neck in the process. He just floored it in reverse, right up a hill, an exposed hill, and kept going until we were over the lip of it. In addition to their specific tasks, many of the Canadian troops found themselves assigned to the gruesome job of locating massacre sites and mass graves for the United Nations. We went into a school, actually. That's where there was, a, they had all the children lined up. And I, I guess their schools were like different grades. And they had all the children lined up. And, uh, it looked like they played a game with the children. Like they chopped their heads off. And then they'd, they'd sign their names, like it was like a game. No, I'm okay. No, I'm okay. I gotta get this out. Um, And I think, like, you know, how can people do this to people? Like, you know, like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't accustomed to this. Like, you know, you know, I've done my sentry duties. I've done out in the field and, uh, I don't know. One day, after spending seven hours looking for a specific mass grave, Corporal Casavoy left the officer he was with for a minute or two while he went to relieve himself. So I step over a bump to get some privacy and my foot sinks straight down. So I hear a lot of snapping like twigs and all that. And then all I could think about at the time was, God, I gotta clean the damn boots up again. So I looked down to pull my foot out and I found that I was in the chest cavity of a body. So uh, instead of doing the normal thing, just taking one step backwards to get out of there, I kind of leaped backwards, tripped and rolled into uh, the mass grave. I kind of had a freak out episode where you, you leap and get the, get the hell out of there as soon as you can. So I scrambled out of there, first chance to get, and I'm standing at the top and I start yelling for the surgeon, come on over, I think I found what we need. They, they went to churches for, they went there for comfort, because you know, you expect to, you know, the church, you know, you're always brought up, the church is going to protect you and, you know, go there for asylum and that. And uh, that's where a lot of the slaughters were done. You know, we went to church and they were just riddled with bullets. Mothers clutching their babies, bodies half decomposed. And, and uh, that was my biggest thing, you know, I want to get home and make sure my kids are okay. That was my, my biggest effect. UN forces in Rwanda continue to struggle this week, with hundreds of thousands of civilians displaced during the genocide who are refusing to leave refugee camps around the country. It's been several months since the civil war in Rwanda officially ended, but local governments and non-governmental organizations seem unable to convince these families and individuals that it is indeed safe to return home. Early attempts by the UN to encourage the refugees to leave the camps were doomed to failure. 
Hutu militants in the camps didn't want their countrymen returning to their homelands that were now being governed by Tutsis. Inevitably, at the Kabeho camp, the situation exploded into violence, and hundreds of thousands of refugees took to the roads trying to escape. Ethnic tensions were still very high, and the refugees were attacked as they fled. Major Lancaster headed for one of the camps to try to help, but never made it. My car kept getting filled up with, with uh, people who were cut off uh, and being stoned on the road as, as they tried to transit uh, villages. And I ended up near the end of the afternoon alone in this vehicle, uh, with the vehicle already full of uh, women and children that had been hit by uh, incoming bricks and sticks and so on. When the, uh, the head man of the group pointed the, the route, had to go off the main road and up hill uh, on a dirt road through a little village, my heart sank. It smelled like an ambush from, from half a kilometer away. And sure enough, when we got into this village, uh, the first thing that started was the children went berserk. Uh, the village children came in running among the, uh, the stragglers and hit uh, everything that was standing up. The crowd grew closer and closer around me and started jumping on my vehicle as a, as a way of getting away from the kids. When the, the village elders started to take a hand, um, throwing bricks and, and uh, using bigger clubs, I pulled a couple of babies in off their mother's backs to try and get them away from, uh, from the bricks and to leave their mothers some sort of freedom of action. And it got worse and worse and worse. And I, I could see people going down in my rearview mirror um, being clubbed, uh, killed. And all of a sudden, it stopped. Three men had stepped out of the village, three village elders, I guess they were, um, with bigger clubs than everyone else. And they pushed everyone back and said, stop, this is not right. And there we were, there I was, wearing a blue beret, supposedly as, as, a, uh, as a member of a world body with, with uh, credibility and, and force and power and interest from the nation's people. All the best thinking in the world went into construction of the UN. And it didn't mean a damn thing at that time and place. The next day, I, I got up with the intention of going back down to the, to the trouble area and found I just couldn't move. Just couldn't get myself out the door. And uh, I realized then that I'd had it. I just could not go on. The madness of Rwanda would take its toll on everyone. General Dallaire, who'd lived all the horrors and helplessness of the last eight months, became terribly at risk. Uh, I had been targeted specifically by the, by the Hutus to be killed. And um, that made negotiations and going through the lines difficult and so on. It also made it difficult for the other white guys uh, because they were out to get, to get the, the white people. About mid-July, I'd be running bombardments or ambushes, daring them. I had lost my sense of humor. The Department of National Defense has announced that it's launching a series of studies to develop strategies to help Canadian peacekeepers deal with the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD is an ailment soldiers who've served in difficult environments, such as Bosnia, Somalia, and Rwanda may develop. It's a physical condition in which the chemical signals of the brain change, which can affect the soldier's behavior in theater and once they're back home. While doctors are optimistic that treatment programs can relieve many of the symptoms, much about the disorder is still unknown. And it can often take years for the effects of PTSD to show up and be recognized. It's said that every soldier lives a different war. Certainly, they each react differently to the stress and the trauma of surviving conflict. Simply talking about what they were seeing, doing, and living through in Rwanda was an effective way for many to deal with the mental strain. But if you talk about it, it, it you just shared a wealth, more or less, and you get it out of your system, 
and you feel a lot better. You feel like that load's taken off your chest. And talking does help, big time. And I'd find myself sitting on, on my bed after, after working all day, sitting on my bed talking to the other soldiers and just more or less probing them. And at first, some of them wouldn't open up and talk. But after, after they, they listened to our conversation, they got more into it and more into it to where all of a sudden now they wanted to put their five cents in on what they saw. And it seemed to relieve them after a while. And it got them through that day anyway. It was encouraged every team after they finished their shifts. The team leader, either a nurse or the senior med a on the team, sat down with their personnel for 20 minutes before the people were released, had them talk about what they saw, what they felt, what they thought they, they didn't do right or they could have done better, and just to try to get this out of the way so that it could be filed away. Not everyone had such good support. Many were left feeling alone. For them, asking for help meant being labeled as weak or cowardly, a label that could eat away at a promising military career. So they bottled up the sights, the sounds, the smells, and the pain, and locked them away. But the horror never really disappears, and months or years later, the memories bubble to the surface. Some try to cope with the trauma of their experiences by themselves, Others go for counseling. Either way, there's no guarantee of relief. It's nothing what I expected. You know, I expected, you know, I figured that, you know, I'd do my job, you know, it's my job as a medic to come back and uh, I'd just carry on. But uh, you couldn't carry on. It affected my wife, it affected me, my, my family. Um, it was really hard, um, and there was no support there. That's the worst thing, I think, of being a Canadian soldier, is that uh, uh, weakness is, is frowned upon. So uh, the easiest thing to do is take everything, push it to the side and pretend it was a movie. And it isn't until you get hit by uh, smells, the smells are the worst, that'll trigger a memory. And then it's like a film starting up in your head. And either you can let it run through or you can push it back into that spot. Their foods can't eat anymore. Uh, grilled chicken can't eat it. Looks like a dead body. Uh, their vehicles uh, that I see, like rusted vehicles, can't go near them. Uh, children have a hell of a time, a hell of a time looking at little kids, especially uh, newborns, because they were uh, a plaything for the Hutus. They really like killing kids. Well, I have not expounded on the treetops or the, the houses, um, but I have undergone 10 months of therapy. And it didn't hit me right away. It took nearly two years to all of a sudden not being able to cope, not being able to hide it, not being able to forget it or to put it in the, keep it in the drawer. And I became suicidal because there was no, there was no other solution. You couldn't live with the pain and the sounds and the smell and the sights. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't stand the loudness of silence. Sometimes I wish I'd lost a leg instead of 